Hi everyone, my name is Patsy Montesinos and welcome to the Society of Professional Journalists, New England chapter. We have a Zoom meeting with Jerry Mitchell. So Jerry Mitchell's work investigating civil rights era cold cases, you know, resulted in prosecution and conviction for four Klansmen for the murder of Mississippi NCAACP's Medgar Evers, the 1963 bombing of Birmingham Church that killed four girls, and the 1964 slayings of three civil rights workers. Um, so what interested you about journalism and why did you pick this field? Well, I picked journalism for a pretty simple reason. I liked writing. I like, you know, it was a job I thought, Oh, they'll pay me to write. Okay, I'll do that. That sounds like a fun job. <laughs> I heard about it at high school, uh, whatever it was, career day or something like that. Someone came in who really hadn't even graduated that long ago. I went to school with the guy's sister. So, <laughs> you know, and uh, so anyway, that's what I found out. It's like, oh, journalism. Okay, so then I did it in junior, uh, when I was a junior, senior high school, I was editor of the high school paper. And uh, the, the, Tiger Times, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, I liked it. I enjoyed the writing, and once I got into it, I figured out pretty quickly that I was a lot better reporter than I was a writer, which was kind of an eye-opening thing for me. But yeah, that's what kind of what got what led me down that that trail. So, what began or prompted your journey into investigating the old civil rights era cases? I I, I saw a movie. I saw the movie Mississippi Burning um, when it, it was actually the press premiere. I got assigned to go cover this as a story. And I wound up sitting next to one of the FBI agents who investigated the case. And there was another one, FBI agent, former FBI agent who investigated as well. And so I, I was, you know, I didn't, I was woefully ignorant about the civil rights movement, all this violence that took place. Uh, and so what I couldn't believe in the movie was over with, there were more than 20 Klansmen involved in killing these three young men, uh, James Cheney, Andy Goodman, and Mickey Schreiner, and nobody ever prosecuted for murder. And that was something I couldn't wrap my head around. I covered courts, so I was familiar with courts. And, uh, you know, I'd never seen anyone, you know, one person, much less, you know, more than 20 people get away with a triple murder. You know, that was something that was, I couldn't wrap my head around. So when you became interested in these cases, how did you approach the investigations? Um, I think the way, you know, the way I approach them is, you know, pretty much standard for most reporters, investigative reporters. You, the first thing you want to do is a document sweep. You want to kind of go in and say, hey, what documents exist? You know, what law enforcement documents exist? What, or is there anything left in terms of the trial file or the transcript or all those things? And of course, basically all those were missing. You know, when I started out, they weren't anywhere to be found. So, uh, uh, but eventually there was a transcript and eventually the, uh, prosecutor found the murder weapon in his father-in-law's closet, which sounds like I'm making it up, but yeah, it really happened. How did people react when you started looking into these cases? They, there were a lot of people who were not happy. <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, it got better over time, but when I first started writing about these cases in 89, um, yeah, I mean, I, I I had people confront me. I had people, you know, send me angry, you know, nasty letters and, you know, phone calls and threats and all those kinds of things. So that was pretty sobering, <laughs> the reaction. So Medhart Evers is an important name here. Um, he was murdered and 26 years later, you found important information. Um, can you tell us how your article helped reopen the case and eventually like led to the convic conviction? Yeah, well, it, it, you know, basically what happened is um, there was this, there was this agency in Mississippi, it was defunct, but it was called the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, which was a state segregation and spy agency. And they existed from the 50s into the 70s. The Mississippi legislature voted to see all those records for 
50 years, like 132,000 pages of spy files to seal for 50 years. So my first thought when I found that out was, well, there's got to be something in there. You know, they wouldn't be sealing it for 50 years, you know. All good journalists, if someone tells you you can't have something, you just want it that many times worse, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's what happened with me. And so that's what got me obsessed with the Sovereignty Commission, which, and so what I found out at the same time in the state of Mississippi was prosecuting Byron D. Beckwith for the murder of Meg Reverse's other arm of the state. The Sovereignty Commission was secretly assisting defense, uh, trying to get him acquitted. Nobody knew that. And so my story ran October 1st of 89. And it's just kind of like one little thing led to another. And that's why I always tell reporters, I mean, just a lot of times what you just need to do is stay with a story. I mean, it's so easy to get, I think when I was a young reporter, I thought, oh, I, I'm, I'm writing this big expose and everybody's gonna open their eyes and see and come to their senses and do do the right thing. and. And what I discovered is uh, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> or a lot of times, most times it probably doesn't happen. So what happened was it was more over time. You know, I, I did that story and then I talked to Marley Evers, the widow of Megar Evers, and she said the case should be reopened. The newspaper editorialized it should be reopened. The Jackson City Council said it should be reopened. And eventually the district attorney's office reopened the case by the end of that month. And then just, again, these kind of series of circumstances that took place that allowed it to be re-prosecuted. I can't hear you. Is your mute on? Okay. Okay, there we go. Oh, no. Again. It began. There you go. Okay, there we go. Um, so... There was a film, Ghost of Mississippi, based that on was. this this, um, this case, and you were portrayed in that movie by Jerry Levine for your important reporting that helped the case. Like, how did you feel watching that movie? <laughs> well, it's to it's kind of told from the prosecutor's perspective, so it's more like from his perspective. But it, it was it was kind of interesting to watch it. I, I did get to go to the premiere of the film in New York City, so that was fun. I got to go to the premiere of the film in, in, uh, in Manhattan and, and got to see, well, I actually had already gotten to see some of the people because I watched them film it. And they were literally filming it across the street from the newspaper. So that made it convenient. Or not everything, but, but a, a bunch of the scenes were across the street at the courthouse. So after the guilty conviction, many people had hopes of bringing justice to, justice to their families and started exactly. reaching out to you, right? Um, yeah. How did you feel and what led you to look into these other cases? Well, that's really what led me to the other cases. I had family members reach out to me in various cases. Uh, the, the main one was the Vernon Damer family. He was killed by the Klan in 1966. Basically died defending his family from a Klan attack. They firebombed the family. And uh, so he, he ended, anyway, he ended up, uh, uh, the, the family came to me and then after they met with me, I did a story and then, the, you know, the family met with the district attorney, reopened the case. Um, you know, it's a long story, but anyway, eventually got prosecuted anyway. What can but, you tell us about Vernon Damer and his story? Yeah, well, he was a farmer and a businessman. He was an entrepreneur. He had like a, a sawmill, like planing mill, and then he had a little grocery store where this was an African American community just north of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and uh, called Kelly Settlement, still called Kelly Settlement. And uh, so it was kind of like a little, it was like the black community had its own grocery store. It was, you know, this was still Jim Crow days or just coming out of it. And so you still had all those things. So people would shop at his little grocery store. And this was still, they had poll taxes. Vernon Damer was dedicated to voting rights. He believed that's what would change America. And he was right. Uh, but the Klan didn't like that. And he, that's the reason it attacked him and his family. And so Sam Bauer's trial was really interesting. I've heard you talk about it before. What can you tell us about it? Oh, well, yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> well, it depends on which stories you want me to tell. I mean, yeah, it was, it was, 
to be honest, it was a pretty funny trial. It's horrible to say that about a, a tragic event, but there were a, a lot of things in the trial that were actually pretty funny. Uh, he had a Klansman get up and, and he claimed that the Klan was, uh, he said, well, the Klan was a benevolent organization passing out fruit baskets to the needy at Christmas. And of course the prosecutor got up and said, well, just how many fruit baskets did you pass out? And he was like, oh, sad to say, none. <laughs> like I said, it was a funny trial. It was just, it was like one thing after another. The, uh, the guy was a defense lawyer in the case got implicated by a witness during the testimony, like identify him as it being one of the Klan meetings <laughs> where they plotted to kill Vernon Damer. You know, it's just, you can't make this stuff up. This is why I love journalism. And so Bill Roy uh, Pitts, that was uh, a yeah. person who, you know, helped testify and was a Klansman. He approached Ellie Damer at the, and yeah, this was after the trial. Yeah, after after the trial was over, it was a hearing that took place a few months later. And when he walked to the back of the courtroom, he ran into Mrs. Damer, Ellie Damer, the, the widow of Vernon Damer. And he apologized to her and asked her to forgive him for killing her husband. And she forgave him. And he began to cry. She began to cry. It's one of those moments as a reporter you'll never forget. You know what I mean? You just it feel like sometimes you just happen to be in the right place at the right time to witness something, and that was one of those times for me. You helped bring justice to so many families, including uh, Damer and then Ever's wife. Thank you publicly for that. How did that feel as a reporter? Oh, it's very uh, look. It's been wonderful. Uh, the biggest, you know, I've, I've won some awards, which is nice, but the biggest reward to me has been getting to know these families, getting to know uh, the Evers family, the Damer family. Um, I just talked to Marilee Evers the other day, you know. Seems like every time I, we talk on the phone, it's like an hour. <laughs> you never have a short conversation with her, which is great. I really enjoy talking to her, and I'm very good friends with her daughter Rena and and, um, and the Damers are just fantastic. They're just a wonderful family. So it's been a real honor to me to get to know these families. And since your reporting, it's inspired since 1989. There's been um, 24 convictions. Yeah. How, how does that feel? Uh, it feels uh, I'm grateful. I mean, I'm grateful to see justice in these other cases as well. I mean, it's, that's what it's all about. You know, these families, uh, you know, seeking justice and being able to find justice after all this time. It's, uh, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for them. If that makes any sense. I'm happy for, I'm grateful when I see them, you know, I know Vernon Damer Jr. This is the son, oldest son. Um, he basically when his dad was killed, uh, he kind of had to be the person in charge of everything, you know, finding a place for the family to live. What are they going to do? I mean, just everything you can imagine. Um, and so he told me, uh, I didn't, I, I didn't have time to cry. And then when the verdict came down, I looked over at him. It was just tears just streaming down his face, you know, because he finally had time to cry, you know, it's just incredible. So I, I've been very, very blessed to be able to, you know, witness all these things as well. And you put yourself at risk for these stories. Many people uh, sent you angry messages or death threats. And I think, you know, reporters do this a lot, especially in today's with like going to cover protests, but you yeah. talk about living fearlessly. What does that mean? Yeah, well, you know, you know, I, as I as I tell people, I mean, living fearlessly is not it's not about living without fear. It's about living beyond fear. It's living for something really greater than ourselves, and we certainly do that as journalists. I mean, we're our jobs are all about 
you know, trying to find the truth, report the truth, report what's happening, report the facts that we can find out. Um, and, and there are a number of people out there, it seems like especially now, that really hate us or they call us fake news or they, you know, whatever, whatever it is, whatever reason they don't like us or they don't like the fact that we're even covering the protest or whatever it is. So I think for us, we've just got to, you know, as best we can remain professional and do our jobs. And if people yell at us and scream at us, you know, so be, we, you know, there's no reason for us to, I've never felt the need to argue back with folks for the most part. I mean, that's very rarely have I ever argued back with them. I just kind of let them, if they're angry at me, just say what you want to say. My favorite story along that line now this is, I could tell she was older, the woman that called me. And, um, she was, she was cussing me out for writing about these cases. And so I did, I did let her say what she wanted to say and just let her talk. And she finally calmed down and we started talking at like a normal conversation. We got, and then she was like, you have a nice day now. <laughs> it always cracks me up. It's like, if you don't bind to people's anger, sometimes they, you know, they don't, they don't have, they, they can't do anything with it, you know? So in a time where racial disparities are at the forefront of conversations, you know, what can we learn about the cases you helped solve today? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, there's certainly forerunners for these. I mean, you had three police officers give Byron D. LeBeck with an alibi, and that was a bogus alibi. They basically lied, but they did that. Uh, in the Mississippi Vernon case, you had... Um, basically uh, law enforcement officers involved in actual killing uh, of, of the three civil rights workers, including the sheriff. The sheriff wasn't actually at the uh, killings, but he supposedly met them after and said, I'll kill anyone who talks. So, you know, the sheriff was essentially the head of the Klan in Shelby County, wasn't somebody else. And so you've interviewed many members of the Klan and I did. Killers, killers and otherwise, yes. I did. You helped put at least four members behind bars due to their crimes. What can you tell us about the Klan and what you learned throughout the years? Well, the Klan, you know, essentially there, you know, I think what happens is these people, yeah, you know, it's obviously hate. But before people hate, they fear. And, and, and then that fear kind of gets combined with prejudice, if that makes sense. And then that, that fuels dehumanization. And, what, and so when people think of, if you think of these cases in, that, that I've written about, they regarded, I mean, Byron Dale Beckwith said this to me directly. I mean, they think of people who aren't white as mud people or they're, they're less than human in some way. Um, and that's what the Klan, that was the mentality of the Klan. In other words, weirdly enough, they believed that they had justification for killing. You know, if you uh, kill a quote unquote monster, right, and you're doing society a favor. So that's the way they viewed it, that they viewed it. And I think it, in the, you, it sounds like ancient history in some ways, but you look today at some of these unfortunate, you know, killings that we've had, you know, racial killings that we've had, that's really the same mentality. There's this dehumanization, you know, that, uh, you know, that you see that, that basically they're dehumanizing to the extent that they have permission to destroy them, you know, that kind of thing. So that's what I see, yeah. And what can you tell us about the case with the bombing and um... church bombing, the Birmingham church bombing? Yeah, the I worked on that case. That's the four little girls. They were killed by the Klan. The Klan planted a bomb in 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham on September 15th, 1963, and it blew up and killed four girls, blinded a fifth girl named Sarah Collins. Um, but basically. Other than there was one prosecution in 1977 of Bob Shambles, but otherwise no one else had been prosecuted in that case. 
So I, I just, after I got done with the Damer case, I was working, I just was writing about what are the cases were being looked at, and that was one of them. And so I ended up talking to Bobby Cherry, who was one of the last living suspects in the case. And we just talked very briefly. And then he, um, anyway, months later, I get an email from his wife says, Bobby wants to talk to you. I'm like, okay. So I, he lived near Tyler, Texas, which is in East Texas, which is not far from where I grew up. So I drove over, met him and his wife, took him out for barbecue, and then talked to him for six hours. He's like, oh, I didn't have anything to do with that church bombing. I left that sign and shop at a quarter to 10 because I had to get home and watch wrestling. He even pulled out this sworn statement of this woman. Yes, we're all sitting around watching wrestling. So we know this as reporters, and this is the way we say it in the South. Even if your mama tells you she loves you, check it out. So that's what, you know, I did the next day in the newsroom. I was like, hey, Susan, this is our librarian, Susan Garcia. And I said, Susan, just check with the Birmingham News and see what was on TV that night. Because they used to, when I was, especially when I was younger, print the entire TV schedule in the newspaper. And so the next day she came back to me and said there was no wrestling. So come to find out his alibi wasn't any good. And uh, no one had ever for whatever reason, dug into that to find out that he was lying about his alibi. And so he got arrested in that case and convicted. And he got uh, four life sentences, one for each one of those girls. He was convicted in 2002. It just seems like in every case, you looked at every single detail and were able to find something that the prosecutors or just didn't pay attention to. I, I, I'm amazed, I, you know, in a lot of these cases, like the Mississippi burning case, you would think that that's the thing I thought going in, there'd been books written about it. You know, you assume going in that there's no way you can find out anything that, you know, nobody else knows. Um, but I actually was able to find out in that case, the Mississippi burning case, who the informant was. So that's uh, the guy that told the FBI where the bodies were buried, Mr. X, as he's sometimes called. So it's fascinating. You see, it's just digging. That's all it is. It's simple reporting. And it really, it's just realizing it. I always say it's just digging down where you are. You, you know, you almost kind of find a soft spot, if that makes any sense. And whenever you, wherever you find the soft spot, you begin to dig down. And that's, that's, I think, a really good strategy. You know, because you can't, there's no way you can comprehensively do a global search on everything, every detail. So if you just find the, the places that are obvious to dig, then that's where you dig and see what, see what pans out. Why do you think these, in all these cases, prosecutors just kind of brushed over the details and didn't really dig into them? Well, you had several factors at work. I mean, in Mississippi and Alabama both, you had uh, the local authorities, let's just say, if we're, if we're really kind, didn't really want to solve a lot of these cases. You know, Emmett Till, if you go back in time in 1955, they never investigated locally, even though it was prosecuted locally. I mean, they didn't do anything. The sheriff testified for the defense for crying out loud. What does that tell you? You know, so, uh, so those are the kind of things that were happening back then. And they were, and the juries were all white and all male uh, because women couldn't even serve on juries in Mississippi up until 1968, which is kind of shocking, but it's true. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think there wasn't any motivation to, and then, you know, maybe the FBI wrote it in a file, but, you know, the feds didn't prosecute it, it ended up being a state prosecution. So that, that information may have sat in a file and not, not have been used. So you uncovered all this systemic racism, oh, yeah. like officially covering up, you know, Megar Evers' murder. But how does that present itself today, especially, you know, with George Floyd being at the forefront of the movement today? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think what I was talking about earlier about dehumanization, I think that's part of the problem is you've got this mentality, unfortunately, among certain law enforcement that we're the good guys. They're the bad guys, 
and, and, and they justify their mistreatment. And I haven't completely investigated the Floyd thing, but I, I watched the, in between, I watched the New York Times video and I watched the raw video as well. Um, and it looks like to me they pulled him out of the car even after he was in the car, which made no sense to me. It was almost like they wanted to punish him. And I don't know if I'm completely right in that assessment or not, but that was kind of my, my speculative guess, I guess you could say. But, he, but it shows you the mentality. I mean, he's, he's asking to, he's saying he can't breathe and the officer never moves his knee. Why not? I mean, it's just kind of humanity, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's not like, it's not like the guy's going anywhere. He's got handcuffs on him and two other officers on him. Like he's going to go somewhere, but you get the impression that it was more than just that it was punishment for whatever reason. Like, and like I said, if you had that good guy, bad guy mentality, this guy deserves what he's getting. He deserves to be mistreated. And, uh, and race plays into that as well, because they're thinking, you know, if it were a white guy, they, I have a feeling police would have acted differently. You know, I just, that's my feeling. Uh, but obviously just the mentality, I think definitely plays into it, which is, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. And, and these bad guys, they, you know, they, they deserve to be mistreated. You know, and we even heard politicians that kind of have espoused that line, which doesn't help where they say, yeah, I want you to mistreat those guys. Uh, when you're, when you're arresting uh, uh, someone on criminal charges, I want you to mistreat them. Or you're arresting somebody for murder. Of course, the thing is, you're not convicted yet. You follow them saying it may be somebody that's actually innocent you know they haven't gone on trial yet so you know the the police are not there to make the final judgment that's not their job their job is to uh, you know secure and to maintain peace i mean they're not they should not be in the job of killing people you know we talk about these police officers and persecutors and how they help cover up all these crimes years ago and still today there's racial disparity and systemic risk oh, no uh, presence um how do you think we we got here today and why hasn't there been a change or reform well, there has to be a will to change you know what i mean and and i think too often people when they look at say the civil rights movement or the, the rights of, of of americans they 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 see um uh, the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks sat down, Martin Luther King stood up, African-Americans got their rights, yay, you know, end of story. And it's just not true. I mean, uh, you, know, um, it, you know, it's not quite that neat. And plus, I mean, just little simple details like Rosa Parks wasn't the first woman that sat down on a bus and got arrested in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. She was actually the fifth. So there are a lot of details a lot of times the civil rights movement there are a lot of people involved in the civil rights movement. And then on top of that, we've never really addressed some of these issues. I mean, if you go back and read the Kerner, is it the Kerner Report, Warner Report? Yeah, Kerner Report, I think it was, in 68. The report that came out in 68, basically about uh, some of the problems. Uh, you know, you might as well have written it today in terms of racial disparities, problems in terms of our justice system, problems in terms of things that need to be addressed. It, it sounds like it, it was written today. And so that, that indicates there hasn't been a serious effort to kind of look at these things. Uh, I do have some hope. I mean, I think there has been a move among both, uh, you know, conservative progressives to want to reform, for example, prisons and making those more, um, you know, that's obviously on the back end of things, but at least making prisons a situation where you're not just having a revolving door. And that's part of the process of what needs to be addressed, but obviously there's a lot of things that need to be addressed. And I think you just briefly mentioned how we're just in school, we're just taught, you know, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and that's it. But you know, we're not taught about, I mean, I never learned about these cases. I never learned that, you know, there was prosecutors and police chief that helped cover it up some clan uh, murdering, you know, African-Americans. Why, right. uh, 
why is it important, you know, for us to learn these things in school? Well, if we don't, I mean, it's pretty, and this has been said before many times, and it, but I think it's true, is if we don't know our history, we tend to repeat it. I mean, that's the thing you see. I mean, uh, the killing of Ahmaud Arbery kind of reminded me of the old slave patrols. I mean, basically every, anyone white in the South, you know, and this was Mississippi and elsewhere, they had, any white man had authority over any one black. And it was like, if they saw them walking down the road, they had the authority over them to question where they were going, what they were doing. And that's what it kind of reminded me of. It's like, here's these white guys and they, they suddenly have this, you know, feel like they have this authority and Georgia law gave them at least some authority, um, which I thought was kind of a crazy law, but that's, you know, my opinion. Um, but that's what, that's what you saw play out. It's like they had the authority over this kid, you know, um, which is sad. I mean, you know, what, what gives you that authority? Why aren't you, you suspect him of a burglary. Why aren't you calling the police and saying, Hey, I, you know, there's this kid and I think maybe he has something to do with his burglary. whatever it is. Fine. Call the police, but that's their job, not your job. You know, you're, it's not your job as a citizen to pull guns out to try to, you know, Stop, stop him. I mean, that's just, that, that was insane. That's just insane. But it, again, it goes back to the mentality that people have and it just has never really gone away, unfortunately. What advice would you give to reporters covering these injustices today? Covering the Ahmaud Avery case, covering George Yeah, Trump? yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's one of the things, the pieces I would, I would challenge reporters to look at is look at some of the history because I think it helps to give important context to these events that happen, because it, it's so easy to look at them and think they're happening in a vacuum. Oh, well, this is just a bad guy, a rogue guy, or whatever you know, the mentality is. Uh, and, and maybe that's the case, I don't know, it depends on the case, but it, look deeper at, at kind of the history of what, what's happened in this country with regard to race. I mean, it's not been, it's not a pretty history. <laughs> yeah. So what can you, what can we learn from your book, Race Against Time? What can you tell us about your book? Um, well, I, 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 this is what I tell people now, I, that I hope it outrages you and inspires you. So that's my, my two things that I hope it does. That it's, uh, it's, you know, certainly not just my story, but the story, even though it is written first person, obviously, but it's the story of these families and, and their courage and willing to, push for justice all these years later and finally seeing justice. So I think that's inspiring to me. And I, I have grown to love all these families and um, been very fortunate, you know, to get to know them. Uh, so I hope that's what people take away that sometimes even in the face of what seemed like impossible odds, things can happen. And my advice to young reporters or any reporter is probably one of the you know, people say, well, what is the, you know, kind of the one thing I should have as a reporter, or one thing I should do as a reporter. And that, my advice would be, be persistent. Be persistent. Don't give up. Yeah, never give up. Because you, there will be times when, you, you know, you'll be writing a story that sometimes even your editors don't want you to write, you know, and, uh, be persistent, be persistent in what you're doing and don't give up. I, I, like I said, early on in my career, I think I thought if I wrote something, it would, you know, change the world kind of thing. And, and that didn't happen. But what I did find over in my early career was if you wrote and continue to write about something, that's when you could begin to change things. You, ne you never gave up writing. You kept writing about it. And then finally, something happens. I always say you have to embarrass people into doing the right thing sometimes. <laughs> so you say you're, you know, you've mentioned that you're still in contact with the families. Have they oh, yeah. read the book? Yeah, they've read the book. They, they like the book. The ones, the ones I've heard back from <laughs> have liked it. Have liked it. They've been, they've been happy with it. So I'm, I'm grateful. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, 
it was their journey too. It's not just my journey, it's their journey. So yeah. yeah. I want to go back to talking about the KKK because sure. um, I feel like it's been getting so much attention, you know, from the 2016 elections, the increase in hate crimes and the yeah, country. That's true. Yeah. So people are petitioning uh, to make them a terrorist group. What is your opinion on that? They are a terrorist group. I mean, what, what was the question? <laughs> I, I don't understand our reluctance of the FBI. I, they may have some le legitimate reasons why. I don't know what those would be, but I'm just saying maybe they have some legitimate reason. But there's no question that the Klan's a terrorist group. I mean, come on. I mean, I, you just look through history, you know, um, how many people that the Klan has killed and, and the terrorist acts that they carried out, you know, they were formed at the end of the Civil War. And, and, you know, we, we typically talk about the 60s, but listen, there is a ton of violence that was carried out after the Civil War, during Reconstruction. I mean, I just look how many lynchings there were, you know, between the Civil War and, and, and the Civil Rights Movement. I think there were well over 4,000 more, you know, lynchings of African Americans. So it's... Uh, and others too, not just African Americans, but anyone. Were you ever threatened by them when you were looking into these cases? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I had one Klansman say that he knew where I lived and had pictures of me and my family. And another Klansman say that, um, um, you know, he, anyway, basically that he had, yeah, he was going to, he didn't say he was going to stab me, but he was it's something along those lines, you know, that basically he was going to, he wanted to see my throat slit and, you know, and, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty vile. And he, he repeatedly called me for a while. So. How did you react to those? Were you ever scared or? Well, I did, I did call the FBI in a couple of cases. So, yeah. So we did at least find out, try to find out who it was. Um, so that, you know, you know, it just kind of comes with the territory for those who are veteran reporters or even young reporters. I'm sure you've dealt with some, some kind of intimidation or threats or something in what you've covered. I mean, it's just some people, for whatever reason, they want to try to bully you or try to get you off the story or threaten you in some way. So it's nothing new for reporters. So, yeah, you, it kind of comes with the territory, especially when you're writing about the KKK. Uh, you know, the KKK as an organization is just not as strong as it was, say, back in the 60s. I mean, it was pretty powerful in Mississippi politically as well. I um, mean, you had judges that belonged to it, you know. I mean, all sorts of people belonged to it, people even in power. Or they kind of nodded and winked at their violence that they carried out. But the thing is, it's... It, bigger than the Klan, if that makes any sense. Like white supremacy and white nationalism is so much bigger than KKK. It's this uh, Christian identity was a, r a real big thing. And it's not a group, it's a belief system where they believe that Adam and Eve were white people. It's a very racist religion. They believe that Adam and Eve were white people and all the non-white races were created on the sixth day and they were quote, mud people. Like that's what Byron D. Beckwith told me. When I when I met with him, um, and so they're you know, it's very anti-Semitic. There are a lot of anti-Semitism in these groups as well. So yeah, I didn't, I just think that clearly the Klan is a terrorist group, and I don't know why our reluctance to refer to domestic groups as terrorists when we're so eager to to tag uh, foreign groups as as terrorists. I find that fascinating. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you have to go that far back in history to find that uh, the KKK's terrorist acts. I mean, they were, uh, they were replete in Mississippi. We can even compare how America treated the Black Panthers versus the KKK. Oh, yeah. It's a great comparison. Uh, you know, if you look at um, when they entered the California Capitol, what was it in 68 or whatever, they immediately passed all these laws to, to ban guns. That's kind of fascinating. All this, you know, gun control laws got passed because of the Black Panthers. 
it's kind of and, and and you're seeing that just like you just said before like look at history like you're seeing that today versus like right. people you know protesting to not wear masks with rifles but then you have like black people protesting with guns and then they get arrested yeah of course exactly well i always think of what happened in michigan the other day a bunch of white guys showed up with a bunch of guns they did you know they didn't arrest any of them <coughs> and i always think to myself if that had been a bunch of black guys i wonder how they would have reacted you know what i mean like would they have gotten the exact same treatment which was just like let them just walk in oh guys god go take those guns home. Come on. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the attitude. I mean, you've seen people do it on videos. I'm sure some of you have seen this where, you know, there'll be, uh, they'll give someone like a AR 15, uh, a black guy walking down the road with an AR 15, how they react to him compared to a white guy, you know, a white guy was like, Oh, come on, you can't carry that around. You know, that's like there was a reaction to the white guy. The black guy was like down on the ground, you know, they were handcuffing him, everything, you know, they were, you know, and that's just, it just shows we make a difference. Whether people realize it or not, we make a difference. And I think it all comes back to what you said earlier about the mindset. The mindset. Exactly. Well, they believe that it's a black guy, it's a bad guy, and, and therefore, you know, we, we, we've got to go after him or we've got to, you know, do this or do that, or even mistreat him. If, you know, we've got to teach him a lesson. I, I think that was kind of what I sensed in the Minneapolis thing. We've got to teach this guy a lesson. You know what I mean? It's one of those kind of deals. Yeah. I mean, they just no humanity at all. None. Zero. What do you think needs to happen uh, with police and police? Well, we get, we got to change the mentality. We've got to change the mentality. I mean, I think, you know, how do we train police officers? What do we do when we train police officers? And I don't know this intimately, but I know a little bit because I've been there when they've been training, but they spend a lot of times, a lot of time. I'm not saying you shouldn't spend as much time on like firing a gun, gun safety, all that kind of stuff. And if you have a gun, the odds increase that you're going to use that gun. And I'm not trying to not carry you know, for officers not carrying around guns, but that is part of what happens with these things that they're kind of trained to use them. And maybe, maybe that we should spend more time talking about how not to use them. If that makes any sense, it, that it should be an absolute last resort. This is not something you should, this is not something you, your gun should not be coming out of your holster very often. I mean, it should be very rare. Uh, but unfortunately, I think there's that training. It's just the mentality. What you saw in Georgia, uh, where the guy obviously resisted arrest, I mean, and, and started running away and had the taser, and they just shot him in the back, you know? So it's just, he's getting away. Let's get him, you know, instead of, so what? <laughs> So what if the guy runs away? We got a car. <laughs> we and we got friends. We can we can we can arrest this guy. So but unfortunately that, that wasn't what happened. Well, I think we're at um just enough time to let people ask questions. Okay, great. Very good. I looks like we got some I, I called them up. Do you want me to do we want to go in order? Sorry, this is the disembodied voice. Yeah, so I'm going to try and do. Uh, right. So, does T, T swim? T swims, yeah. She said she attended my event in Oxford. Thanks. And I stated that Byron Deal Beckwith lived in Carroll County. Where in Carroll did he live? I was born and raised in Carroll County. I'm trying to remember where it was. I think it's the main. It's the main town, like it's the county seat of Carroll County. And I can't think of the name of that. Uh, but I, I think he lived there just outside town. He had a trailer. I can find that out. I know somebody who actually went up to interview him when he was living in a trailer there. Um, okay. Uh, Adam says, do you think journalists are doing enough to investigate white supremacist organizations today? Um, 
we're doing some reporting on that. I think, of course, our field, uh, our profession has been hurt by cutbacks. And so there aren't as many journalists today investigating these organizations as, as there have been probably in the past. So yes, I think it would be great if we could have more journalists investigating these white supremacist organizations. I, and I'm a big proponent of going and talking to them. I think that's a, a valuable thing. Um, and then uh, have your conversations with Klan members giving more insight on how we might prevent young people from becoming extremists. I think so. I mean, I think, like I talked about, I think fear kind of lit, lit, you know, becomes part of that mix, fear and prejudice. Maybe having people have some, some prejudice they've either grown up with or adopted from friends or whatever. So I think that um, we've got to do is talk to kids early, you know, and begin to educate kids early. I do think education does help. It's not a panacea and because there are people who are horrible racists who are also uh, pretty smart people, at least IQ wise. Uh, so it, it's unfortunately, you know, prejudice is something that can infect even people who are intelligent. Um, and then what motivated you to write your book? Well, number one, I had all these stories I wanted to tell. <laughs> I felt like I was like, man, I've got so many great stories to tell. I want to write a book, you know? And so really after the Meg Rivers case, I wanted to write a book and that, that kind of fell through. And then, uh, so then there ended up being more cases and more cases. So by the time I got to the end of it, I, I, really wanted to do a book and I got my book deal uh, in 2009 and it took me long enough to write it right but it kind of the shape of the book changed they wanted me initially to do half history half memoir and then that didn't really work so switched it and made it all memoir which I preferred I thought it made it I think it made a better book that way I think it's just a better book that way uh, and then do you think that journalists before you gave up on the cases you investigated if so why well, some did, yeah. And I just think journalists didn't dig into it, to be honest with you, the most part. It was just, it was kind of like history. Uh, I think David Halberstam said that once. It was a very kind comment about me that people thought it was history, but it, was, but it still belonged to history and it belonged to journalism. So I think he's right. I think these cases, I think that's why in almost every one of these cases, it was reporting a reporter that got the cases reopened. And I think that says a lot about journalism and that's, that's a good thing. What we can do to try to help, you know, justice or, you know, or just an exposure to what the truth is. Cause so many of these families don't even know the truth of what happened to their loved ones. I mean, that's horrifying. Um, and uh, yeah, Carrollton, she T came back Carrollton. That's it. It's Carrollton. You are correct. <laughs> I couldn't think of the town. It's Carrollton. He lived either right inside the city limits of Carrollton or maybe just may have, may have been outside. He was living in a trailer. Uh, Jim Ewing's the one who went and interviewed him. Um, and he said, are you hopeful that the number of racially motivated cases are decreasing in the U S well, you know, I hope so. I mean, we, we don't necessarily have the exact same kind of killings that we had in the sixties, obviously where the, um, but unfortunately, you can tell how many, I mean, because of video now, thank God for video, right? You know, now we're able to see, it's not like police could kill someone and they could put a gun in their hand and say, oh, he, he shot at us. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and that kind of thing. Uh, the video captures these things. And so they're I think that's a good thing that's happening now. People are recording these things with their own cell, you know, phones, or you've got, I think New York Times, a lot of what they, they piece together sometimes is just surveillance video uh, that maybe neighborhoods, you know, houses have or businesses have that help us to kind of begin to, you know, get a full picture. And I want to give them a shout out because I think some of the reconstructions that they have done with videos and these killings have been excellent. They've done an excellent job of kind of piecing these together. Um, 
let's see. Uh, can you tell some of the things your work you're doing right now? Yes, we're working on a project called Poverty in the Pandemic here in Mississippi. And we got a grant from the Pulitzer Center. We're very excited about that. And we're basically digging into, um, you know, looking at the real impoverished places, how they've been affected by the pandemic. And some of them have been really, really hard hit. You have to really look at it a per capita basis as opposed to total population. And you really begin to get a picture of some of the devastation to some of the poorest areas of Mississippi. And of course, as you all know, these COVID cases are on the rise now and, and including Mississippi, we had our biggest number of COVID cases today or reported today, I think it was from yesterday. So I suspect that will continue and I'm sure it'll be all over the country. I mean, it's not like it's gonna be unique here, but we pretty much opened everything back up. Um, and then uh, any other manuscripts or future book projects coming along? Oh yeah, I always got projects. <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to do a book on my serial killer guy that I wrote about and he got prosecuted, but uh, so far, I haven't been able to interest the publisher in it. I, I'm, I'm continuing to work on that one, <laughs> trying to figure out maybe if I can have a different approach, maybe they'll, they'll go for it. Um, but yeah, and I've got, I've got some interest uh, from movie people and documentary people, possibly uh, with regard to Race Against Time. So that's exciting. We'll see what happens with that. Yeah, the other, my other, my hobby, people ask me, what, what kind of hobby do you have, Jerry? I write, <laughs> and so I, I, I have a very good, uh, talented friend who's a, a, a screenwriter that I team up with, and so he and I have written, I think, five screenplays now, so we've sold one. We've sold one on Emmett Till. That's the one that uh, Taraji P. Henson is playing Emmett Till's mom in. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Mississippi is the high, is the most impoverished state. We are number 50. We are number 50 in case you, you, you're, there's any question about that. We are number 50. And as I say in the book, uh, you know, Mississippi is kind of this land of paradoxes. It's, uh, you know, the nation's poorest people living on some of the world's richest soil. You know, the nation's highest illiteracy rate and yet some of the world's greatest writers. And, uh, and, you know, at the same time that there were all these horrible lynchings that were taking place, a lot of them in Mississippi, uh, Mississippi's state slogan was the hospitality state. So it's all these kind of horrible paradoxes that, uh, that certainly are part of the history of the state. And I think that's it. I think I, I, think I, I, think I, I, think I officially cleared the list unless someone else has one and I didn't, didn't get to it. I don't think so. I think you answered all of them. Oh, someone just said something. Oh, okay. Here we go. Because Mississippi profited off free labor for many years and were able to bounce back. That's true. I mean, I think that people forget about that. You know, African Americans in this country were, you know, slightly enslaved for all those years and how much money, you know, what financial value is that um and i think it's a great question and uh and then beyond i know that we did this story for i, I run a nonprofit. it's called the mississippi center for investigative reporting and one of the stories that we did we looked at public education funding historically in mississippi and mississippi has kind of been not so interested in funding public education historically in fact, they didn't even fund public education before the Civil War. And, um, but one of the more interesting stats that we were able to come up with, uh, just by piecing together data over time, was that, and this is a, a minimum figure, not a maximum figure, this is a minimum figure, that um, African American, I was curious how much African American schools were given less than white schools you know, during the Jim Crow era. And which uh, from, we went from 1890 to 1960. And that's, uh, there were no schools integrated in Mississippi until after 1960. So the, the figures that we came up with is the difference in modern dollars is 25 billion. 
25 billion just for Mississippi. And so I thought, man, that would be a great national project if someone was interested in that to look at funding, the difference in funding for black schools compared to white schools historically, because it wasn't just the South that integrated, I mean, that, that segregated during all those years. Uh, you certainly had it up north as well in a lot of places. I mean, Ohio uh, passed uh, black codes, I think, in, in the, uh, before the Civil War. So there was, a, there was a lot of stuff that was going on around the country. And, uh, yep, I think that's it. And T, I see you're a teacher. That's great. Yeah, Bo Boston had the busing crisis. Let's not, let's not leave Boston off the hook on this. Boston has its own reputation um, historically, and uh, we'd have to say it's deserved <laughs> to a great extent. And certainly the busing crisis, you know, you had people that were, you know, a, a tremendous violence. Uh, so I think it's really easy to look at Mississippi. This is what I tell people. It's really easy to look at Mississippi and say, oh, you know, Mississippi, wag our fingers and talk about how terrible Mississippi was. But I, I hope Miss, that Mississippi is more of a mirror for the nation and race. Uh, so that you can look at Mississippi and not just think, oh, how terrible it was, but what, what, is, what does this show? Or maybe it causes research on our ends as reporters. I'll give a simple example. I grew up in Texarkana, Texas. I had no idea, no idea until this was the 2000s. And I was sitting there, I was invited to this alumni gathering. They invited some of the alumni back for this gathering. And it was the first black student who ever attended my high school. I never knew him, it was before I, I, I got there. The high school was fully integrated by the time I got there. But he started talking and at some point he said, and at some point, you know, our church got bombed. And I'm like, what? Like, I had no idea that there were any church bombings in my hometown. Uh, and so I actually started digging into that in my own hometown and found out that there was this whole series of church bombings in my hometown of black churches that I had no idea. You know, it happened when I was fairly young and I, did, I was unaware of it. And um, I mentioned my mom, my mom knew, but you know, I, 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 you know, it was not anything I knew to bring up. Um, and so it's fascinating, you know, if you really dig down and find out some of the history of where you are, uh, it can be very insightful anyway. Thank you both so much. Um, is there any last things you want to say to wrap up? Oh, buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> I will say one more thing about my book. Uh, if, if you're like me and you like audiobooks, if there are maybe some got some audiobook fans out there, uh, I, I actually got to do the audiobook. So, because uh, uh, I don't know, I just couldn't stand the thought of somebody uh, you like, and I mean no offense to New York in saying this, I just couldn't stand the thought of some New York actor doing my book. I just was like, no, I can't do that. I'm going to. So I begged them to let me do my book, so they let me. So I was very grateful. So it's available on, you know, Amazon, Audible, Kindle, you name it. So anyway. And our website for our nonprofit is MississippiCIR.org if you're interested. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Patsy. Appreciate it.